Good afternoon. Uh, please do keep eating, but I'd like to go ahead and get our program started. My name is Janine Maxson, and I'm AUL's Vice President of External Affairs and Corporate Counsel. And I'd like to welcome you to our launch event for Abuse of Discretion, the inside story of Roe versus Wade, written by a man I'm very proud to call my colleague, the renowned legal expert, Clark Forsyth. Americans United for Life uh, serves as a legal architect of the pro-life movement. We were founded in 1971, two years before the Roe v. Wade decision, and we have been involved in every major Supreme Court case on abortion since Roe. We've also filed over a hundred legal briefs in abortion cases throughout the world. In addition to that, we are the authors of our annual collection of user-friendly pro-life model legislation called Defending Life, which has been hailed by national media as the pro-life movement's playbook. In fact, in the last three years alone, we've been able to work with state legislatures across the country to enact over 60 pro-life laws. And this is so successful that the pro-abortion movement has expressed that it's nervous about what they call a tidal wave of pro-life legislation. We are accumulating victories. Thank you. We are accumulating victories, building momentum, and advancing a culture of life in America, and we will not stop until all are welcomed in life and protected in law. And we're able to do this under the inspiring leadership of our president and CEO, Dr. Charmaine Yost. Dr. Yost. Charmaine began her career in the White House under the Reagan administration, and she was a senior advisor to the 2008 Mike Huckabee for presidential campaign. She received her PhD in politics from the University of Virginia and served as a vice president for Family Research Council. A mother of five, along with her husband Jack, and an author herself, Charmaine has been featured on every major media outlet, including profiles by the New York Times and a profile by the Christian Science Monitor, where they called her the changing face of the anti-abortion movement. Please welcome Charmaine. Thank you, Janine, and thank you all so much for being here. It is really a joy to look out across this audience and see so many of our friends. I'm really, really pleased that you are joining me here today to honor my friend and colleague, Clark Forsyth. Um, we have been very much looking forward to this day as we've, we at AUL have walked with him in this journey towards abuse of discretion. I'd like to start um, as before I introduce Clark by also welcoming his wife, Karen, who's with us here today. Karen, thank you for coming to be with us. So it is my honor to get to introduce Clark, and before I do that, I'd like to set, set up the conversation that Clark is going to walk us through. We're here today to talk about Roe v. Wade and Clark's research about Roe, so I thought it might be appropriate to start with what some of Roe's friends have actually said about it. Always good to start in that context with Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who said that Roe is heavy-handed judicial intervention. Alan Dershowitz, also a friend of our movement, called, <laughs> thank you, John, <laughs> um, called Roe judicial activism. Lawrence Tribe called Roe its own, ver own verbal smoke screen Cass Sunstein said that Roe way overreached, and John Hart Ely, I give him the quote of the day, called Roe frightening. Well, in terms of Roe, we don't actually, one of the reasons I'm so happy that we're here today to talk about Roe is we don't do it that often. In many ways, the other side has succeeded in advancing their argument by getting us to not even look at this landmark decision. But a few years ago, our friend Robbie George called me up and he said that there was an interesting thing going on on the campus of Princeton. They had invited Nancy Keenan, who was at that time the president of NARAL, to come on campus and discuss, discuss Roe and discuss the abortion issue. And because Robbie is a fighter, 
uh, he thought that it was a little odd for a place of such academic excellence as Princeton to give her a complete, uh, complete sway without any kind of debate, any kind of rejoinder to her argument. So he went to the powers that be and argued that they should invite a pro-life speaker, and I got to be that person. So that, just the fact that Robbie was, had to fight internally to make that happen tells you a little bit about the, uh, the lockdown on intellectual discourse on this issue to begin with. But in order to prepare for that event, I went online and I watched Nancy's speech because I wanted to be sure to address any p strong and compelling arguments that she had put on the table. This was my shot at talking to Princeton undergrads, particularly young Princeton women. I wanted to be sure that I had addressed any salient points that she had discussed about abortion. I'll confess I fast forwarded through a lot, but I'm looking for her salient arguments. And here's the point that I found so particularly fascinating as I'm preparing to go to Princeton to talk about abortion. What she talked about in her discussion was Geraldine Ferraro. There was no real discussion of abortion. She barely even mentioned it. Instead, she focused exclusively on the question of female empowerment. This is where our culture is today. This is the context for Clark's research, is that the abortion argument today is set entirely in the context of women and women's empowerment. One of the best quotes that I know of to help illustrate this point comes from our president in the 2008 campaign. And he went on the Hustings and he said, a woman's ability to decide how many children to have and when without interference from the government is one of the most fundamental rights we possess. It is not just an issue of choice, but equality and opportunity for all women. We are in the midst of a very, very deep debate about the position of women in our society and the pro-life movement, frankly, has been slow to engage this argument. Of course, they say a problem defined is a problem half solved. And we in the pro-life movement have Clark Forsyth to thank for his laser-like focus on this question of moving the pro-life movement to come to grips with this argument. While we've been working within the movement to try to convince Americans about the humanity of the unborn, science has accomplished that task for us. And meanwhile, the feminists and their allies in the media and academia and Hollywood have all been convincing Americans, and don't miss this point, and the court, and the court, that women cannot be powerful without abortion. A little known story that is central to the Roe decision is this cultural narrative. Part of our challenge, part of our challenge today is how very deeply effective Margaret Sanger and her heirs today have been in completely co-opting the legal and intellectual establishment in our country. All of those thinkers, all of those thinkers that I cited in the beginning, they may have criticized Roe but they aren't going to work to deeply advance the scholarship about it. However, Clark has stepped into that vacuum. Clark, I remember the day that you came to my office and you told me that about new papers from the justices who had decided Roe, that they were now available for, for research. And he set about spending several years meticulously researching those papers. I imagine you had to blow dust off of them, and they've probably not been disturbed since then. Um, so as it turns out, Roe was not decided. It was not decided. It was not reasoned. It was deliberately created. It was deliberately created. And Clark today is going to tell us that story. I am very, very honored to have the opportunity to introduce him to, to you today because he is uniquely placed for telling this story and revealing its importance to us. He has made becoming one of our nation's leading experts on life-related jurisprudence his life's work. He's been our colleague at AUL for many decades. And this book is a product of 
more than just the research of these papers, but it is from spending literally decades focusing in on everything related to Roe, from interviewing people who have been clerks on the court to studying not just those papers, but studying the justices who've decided these cases. His, his, this expertise that he has developed is so essential to us because the only way, the only way that we will ever beat Roe is to know Roe. And Clark Forsyth has done just that. Well, thank you, Charmaine, very much for those kind comments. Uh, it's a privilege to work for Americans United for Life, and it's a privilege to work for you and for Ovid. Uh, and thank you all for coming today. Thank you for your interest in uh, abuse of discretion. Uh, my wife and I, uh, Karen, uh, flew into uh, Washington, D.C. on Monday from our home in Chicago to find, surprise, a partial government shutdown. And uh, I just wanted to thank uh, any of you here in the room who had anything, anything to do with it for uh, what was one of the most significant uh, birthday presents I think I've ever had. Abuse of discretion has a long background, and I won't tell you all of it, um, but it, it basically tells the story of how the justices in 1971 and 72 created Roe versus Wade behind the scenes, uh, what influenced them, uh, the mistakes they made, and the implications that we're still living under today. And I think, frankly, it's the most important book ever written about Roe since Roe for the simple reason that I've had the opportunity to look at the papers of eight of the nine justices who voted in Roe versus Wade, all but Chief Justice Burgers. And I think it will help people to better understand the scope of the Roe v. Wade, uh, Doe versus Bolton decisions, how the justices uh, have contributed to the 40-year turmoil over abortion in the United States, and what the future might hold for the abortion ish issue in America, including the three abortion cases that are at the Supreme Court this fall. And here's a spoiler alert. The, the movie next year that's coming out on abuse of discretion <laughs> will, will star uh, Johnny Depp as uh, Justice Harry Blackman, and uh, Peter Sellers will play all the other justices. Uh, I started down uh, this path, uh, as I was telling uh, some others this morning, in 2008, when I was trying to read the, uh, the transcript of the Roe versus Wade arguments and listen to the audio uh, of the original arguments. And you can find them if you go to oyez.org, O-Y-E-Z.org, which is a great website on the Supreme Court and r original records and the, and the transcripts and the audios. And in 2008, the transcript and the audio of Roe versus Wade, the two arguments in Roe are th were there and I think the audio of Doe was there, but the transcript was not to be found. And since then, I've helped OYE.org post an accurate account of the transcripts. But it, it struck me that very little is, is known about the vote, Doe versus Bolton decision. And, and what we call Roe versus Wade is really the two decisions, Roe versus Wade and Doe versus Bolton. Roe versus Wade struck down the 30 state laws as of 1972 or 3 that prohibited abortion except to save the life of the mother. And Doe versus Bolton struck down the all the other laws, 19 or, or 20 laws, that had legalized abortion to some degree between 1967 and 1973. So both together, Roe and Doe struck down the laws across all 50 states. But so much, so little has been said about the Doe versus Bolton decision. Uh, if you look at anthologies on the abortion decisions, you only see anthologies and the records about Roe, uh, you don't see anything at all about Doe versus Bolton. And uh, at, at, at OYE.org in 2008, there was, there was no audio or no transcript about Doe versus Bolton. And yet it was a, a critical decision. And what was argued in the case and Dorothy Beasley's argument for the state of Georgia in the case is very important to understand the entire picture of Roe versus Wade and Doe versus Bolton, what happened behind the scenes, how the decisions came out. 
And if you're really interested, I encourage you to go to OYE.org, listen to the audio at the same time you read the transcripts, because doing both together is the only way to hear all that went on and understand accurately all that went on. And I was, uh, I was really surprised at what I found through the Justice's papers. Roe started as a procedural mistake by the justices, uh, and, and that procedural mistake ended up with, uh, with them looking at no record, no evidentiary record whatsoever in either of the cases, and that completely skewed their analysis of the issues in 71 and 72. They, the justices originally took Roe and Doe in April of 71, when Justice Black and Harlan were on the court, there were nine, all nine justices there, and they took Roe and Doe not to decide the abortion issue. They took Roe and Doe to decide a mundane procedural issue about the jurisdiction between the state and federal courts. And the lawyers here today will understand it as the Younger versus Harris case. But it was this mundane jurisdictional issue that they took uh, not to decide abortion. But then a crisis in the court erupted in September of 1971 when within the space of a week, Justice Black and Justice Harlan retired due to ill health. Justice Black died a week later. Justice Harlan died at the end of 1971. That created an internal crisis with two vacancies. Uh, hadn't happened since, I think, uh, the New Deal or, or, uh, or the 1930s. Uh, it flipped the balance of the court and it uh, immediately empowered four justices, Douglas, Brennan, Marshall, and Stewart, to take these two cases, uh, get past the procedural issue, and they saw an opportunity to use these two cases to declare a right to abortion before President Nixon could fill those two vacancies, which he did in January of 1972. And when Justice Powell and Justice Rehnquist joined the court in January 72, the four justices, Douglas, Brennan, Marshall, and Stewart, had pushed the cases so fast and with such energy that uh, J Justices Rehnquist and Powell could not reverse the momentum toward legalizing abortion, even if they had wanted to. And so Roe is a unique case. I think it's fair to say that Roe is the most consequential Supreme Court decision of the 20th century that had the least amount of evidence and facts in the record to, to guide the judicial decision making. So the negotiations behind the scene shaped the outcome more than the record, and there wasn't any, more than the briefs, and more than the arguments in the case. And let me give you just three examples. Viability uh, was a huge factor in the final opinion. Uh, Roe is known for uh, the viability rule, but it was never mentioned even once, the word was not mentioned once, in four hours of argument. Uh, two hours in row, first and second round, two hours in Doe, first and second round. Four hours of argument, the word is not even mentioned. And if you go to oye.org, type or press F5, you can look for the word viability in the transcripts, and it is not there at any point in the four hours. The trimester framework. Roe is famous for the trimester framework. It's a famous part. But trimester was never mentioned in the briefs or the arguments at all. And third, the justices assumed that abortion was safer than childbirth, and that assumption drove the outcome from the beginning to end. But it was disputed, sharply disputed at oral argument, and uh, it, was, it was hardly explored during the four hours of argument. Again, you can, you can hear the audio and read the transcripts. And these three mistakes were crucial to the outcomes of the decision. One of the things that also surprised me was that Roe wasn't inevitable. The conventional history of Roe versus Wade is that it was an inevitable outcome of the Supreme Court's prior decisions on privacy in uh, the 1960s. But uh, in fact, I came to the conclusion that it was really an accident of history. It was substantially influenced by the 1960s and the cultural upheaval in the, uh, of the 1960s. It c coming at the end of the 1960s, many of the justices, and if not all of them, were personally influenced by the sexual revolution of the 1960s in a number of ways. But, it, but Roe was, uh, was ultimately the outcome of the uh, almost unprecedented dual vacancy that came because of the, the deaths of, or the retirements of Justice Black and Harlan. 
I argue that Justices Black and Harlan probably would have voted against uh, a national right to abortion, probably would have left it to the states. But when they retired uh, abruptly in September 71, it empowered a temporary majority of four justices to take the cases and declare the right to abortion. And if Black and Harlan had been on the court for the first round of arguments, I, I doubt that the court would have taken the step to legalize abortion as they did, or perhaps in the manner that they did. Another mistake was this medical mantra that drove the outcome that abortion was safer than childbirth. In 1971 uh, and 72, as they're, while they were deliberating over this question, uh, there was no record in these cases that, that abortion was safer than childbirth. If you look at the standard obstetrical and gynecological textbooks of the 1960s, none uh, argued that abortion was safer than childbirth or had uh, any data that would substantiate that notion. And so this was entered, uh, entered into the cases through the arguments of public interest groups and the briefs and, and, and arguments in the Supreme Court for the first time. It was never tested by cross-examination or a trial in, in the lower courts. And yet that is the essential medical premise of Roe versus Wade. It drove their historical notion of a right to abortion and their creation of a right to abortion. It drove their prohibition of health and safety regulations in the first trimester. It supported their expansion of the abortion right from uh, conception to 12 weeks all the way to viability. And uh, it drove practically every part of the Roe uh, opinion. And yet there was no reliable data, no reliable data whatsoever in 71 or 72. Blackman and Douglas rely upon seven uh, medical journal sites. One's a letter to the editor, uh, uh, but, but none of these support the notion that abortion was safer than childbirth. Another mistake was the uh, abrupt expansion of the right uh, to viability. For the first two years in 71, 72, as, the, as uh, Justice Blackman is writing the opinions, uh, the drafts assumed that there would be a, a right to abortion early in the first trimester, perhaps no farther than, than 12 weeks. That was part of the draft opinions through the first round of arguments, second round of arguments, until November 21st, 1972, when all of a sudden they start negotiating behind the scenes about the breadth of this abortion right. Up, up till that time, Justice Blackmun's drafts had said that the decisive moment was at the end of 12 weeks, and thereafter the states might even be able to prohibit abortion. But they begin to no negotiate behind the scenes, and within the space of a week or two, uh, a, a number of the justices prevailed upon Justice Blackman, who was hesitant, to expand the right 16 whole weeks, from, uh, from 12 weeks to when they thought viability occurred then, to 28 weeks, four whole months. And they had no medical data whatsoever to assess the implications on women's health by expanding this right 16 whole weeks, four whole months. No medical data whatsoever about the implications for live birth abortions, the implications for late-term abortions, uh, for women's health. And that um, move to viability, of course, has been criticized by scholars uh, ever since. Now, this history is key, but it's not just history. The deliberations in Roe are important for the cases that the court is uh, faced with this fall, hasn't uh, yet taken them on the merits, but it is important in particular for the Arizona case that was filed in the Supreme Court last week, Horn versus Isaacson, and Professor John Eastman, the lead counsel in Horn versus Isaacson, is here today. Horn will necessarily address, or at least involve, or have implications for the viability rule and this notion that abortion is safer than childbirth. And I hope that abuse of discretion will help Americans better understand why the court's abortion policy is so way out of line with international standards. Because the court pushed the right to viability and with the health exception of Doe versus Bolton, even beyond viability for any, any reason related to the well-being of the, of the woman, the U.S. is one of just four nations around the globe of 195 that allows abortion for any reason after fetal viability. That has been national policy for 40 years 
and it's because of the court's expansion of, the, of abortion to viability and beyond. I also help, the book will uh, help people understand why the court's abortion policy is so way out of line with American public opinion. The court incre incrementally uh, expanded the right and to such an extent that they went way beyond public opinion polling uh, support for abortion even in uh, 1971 and 72. And they didn't really have a, quite a grasp of the status of public opinion, but they felt that they were being ahead of the cultural curve. They felt that they were kind of pushing the cultural curve and were riding the wave of the cultural curve and where it was going at the end of the 1960s. And yet, um, American public opinion support for late-term abortions has never been significant, never been large, and today is uh, only 7 to 9 percent of Americans support abortion for any reason at any time. A tiny minority of Americans support the scope and breadth of the Roe decision. I also hope the book will help Americans better understand why Kermit Gosnell was unregulated, and, uh, and that was because they prohibited health and safety regulations in the first trimester because of their belief that abortion was safer than childbirth. So let me stop there and take uh, just a few minutes of questions uh, before our other speakers uh, this afternoon. Does anybody have a uh, mic? Uh, yes? Ed, yes? you did not address in your remarks is the, uh, uh, the notion that uh, abortion was a right under the common law. Uh, to what extent was that, I know uh, Professor Destro will probably have something to say about that because of his uh, wonderful work in that area, but, uh, but the, uh, to what extent was that uh, argued and how was that argument uh, you know, taken by the justices and by the parties in, in their, during the oral arguments? Well, the, the state of the, I think, the legal history and evidence at the time would have refuted the notion that there was a right that was deeply rooted in the Amer Anglo-American common law. And it would have shown that the American states were moving to prohibit abortion from conception from the 1930s through the 1960s. And the, the work of Joseph Della Pena, the, the work of Professor Destro and of Joseph Della Pena over the years has clearly refuted the notion that there's any right to abortion in the common law and that the states were moving ahead to protect the unborn child to the greatest extent possible. But as I point out in one of the chapters, th because there was no evidentiary record in the cases at all, no trials, the justices were susceptible to being tempted by unprecedented theories of medicine, such as abortion safer than childbirth, as well as law and history. And the justices latched onto the historical theories of serial means, which uh, Professor Destro has criticized in his writings, among others. Um, and serial means gave the justices some unprecedented th theories of, of the legal history that the purpose of the abortion statutes was only to protect the mother's health, not the unborn child, among others. And the justices latched onto that. And the, um, the justices cite Cyril Means something like seven times throughout the Roe opinion and no legal historian, no other legal historian more than once. And unfortunately, or fortunately, I guess in some sense, since Roe versus Wade, Cyril Means' his theories have been conclusively refuted and we have much better evidence today than we did in, in 1971 and 72. Was, was that part of the oral argument? Was that um, only very briefly, in, in the, uh, for, for two reasons. In the first argument, the, the, the justices were consumed with those, that procedural question, and there was very little focus on history and constitutional law in the first round of arguments. But the attorney for um, Texas and Georgia denied Cyril Means' history, de denied that there was a right, ever a right in Anglo-American history. And, and it, wasn't, it, wasn't, it wasn't thoroughly touched upon, but it was lightly touched upon, and they certainly re, uh, denied it. Um, but um, as Sarah Weddington, who argued for the Texas plaintiffs, 
has since uh, openly t uh, acknowledged, uh, apparently the justice has had Cyril Means' writings on the bench during the oral argument and heavily relied upon him. Other, yes? Did you mention uh, Norma McCorvey? Uh, what role did she play in what you researched? Um, I, um, I did not cover uh, more uh, about her role than, than has already been written. And um, uh, I mean, as you know, uh, she was a, uh, the Texas plaintiff in, in Roe versus Wade who has since kind of renounced her views, become pro-life. She testified against Roe versus Wade uh, the decision in, in before congressional hearings, she filed a case in 2005, 2006 to seek to get the Roe versus Wade decision uh, overturned. But um, my focus was on what was happening behind the scenes in the court, and uh, I have not uncovered more about her role than what is, has already been published. Any others? Yes, Sam? Clark, first of all, congratulations. Um, Thank you. You put in one place um, the thoughts of the pro-life movement that have been collected, and you've done it brilliantly. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, having sat with this for four or five years, uh, and having myself read the manuscript, which you were so kind to send me, um, I, I was wondering what your thoughts are. Do, do we really have uh, a third political branch in our Constitution. As you looked at how this court operated in, in Roe versus Wade, do you think this is just a one-off thing mm -hmm. uh, that just happened here? Or does this happen more frequently than we would like to think? And perhaps the American people need to wake up to see just how accountable to the rule of law this branch really is. Uh, well, that's a... That's a very good question. Uh, I, I guess I would approach it this way. Um, the court was a, uh, a uh, kind of a nest of hornets in 1971, 72. Uh, the tensions were very high. The interpersonal conflicts were very high. And uh, I don't think you can say that today about this court. And um, you know, what's unique about Roe is that since there was no evidentiary record or trial whatsoever in, in either Roe versus Wade or Doe versus Bolton, um, everything that came out was, was behind the scenes, whereas in the, in the normal constitutional case, when the court for, you know, decades, if not centuries, has said we will not decide constitutional questions without an adequate record, you can at least compare uh, the decision and the reasoning with some kind of record in the, in the lower courts, in the district court, or in the court of appeals. And another thing that's unique about, uh, about Roe versus Wade and Doe versus Bolton is that there was a congressional statute in effect in, in 71, uh, 70, 71, that allowed for direct appeal from the district court to the Supreme Court, so there was no intermediate appellate review. So Roe and Doe are particularly egregious examples of reaching a constitutional decision without an adequate record. And, um, you know, I would like to think that, um, you know, today the justices uh, th 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 that are there would have some uh, higher antenna and more sensitive antenna to uh, show these problems and point them out. I hope that answers your question. We done? Uh, Mary, do we uh, another question? Yeah. Yes, well, yes, sir. Congratulations. Thank you, um, thank you. influence the most with the book, and we're five years down the road, what um, are the best outcomes you can think of for your research and book? Well, I, I, try, to, uh, I try to be sensitive to the fact that I, I shouldn't use a lot of legalese and that I, should, I really wanted to write this for non-lawyers. And I'm, I'm hoping that, um, uh, uh, you know, the general public will uh, read the book to help understand what for 40 years has been very obscure and uh, kind of impenetrable. I mean, even, even the fact that most Americans don't know anything about Doe versus Bolton and um, solely focus on kind of Roe versus Wade, um, I'm hoping to introduce Doe versus Bolton to people. Um, and I'm hoping that uh, 
uh, the general public will uh, have a better understanding of the mistakes that were made and the fact that the justices basically legislated. They legislated a nationwide policy and they have imposed it for 40 years. And in that sense, it was not a constitutional decision. It was public policy. And why should the Supreme Court, uh, why should the Supreme Court impose a public policy on the nation uh, for 40 years that so conflicts with American public opinion? And, uh, and I hope to point out to Americans that the court has assumed the role as the National Abortion Control Board, uh, words that Justice O'Connor almost used in 1983, and has failed at that job. And the states, or Congress, with the public health uh, policy capacity and authority that they have as duly representative branches, can do a better job with this issue than the Supreme Court. Thank you very much for coming today. Hi, I'm Bill Saunders. I am Senior Vice President for Legal Affairs and Senior Counsel at Americans United for Life. And it's my privilege to introduce the uh, two distinguished law professors, uh, John Eastman and Bob Destro, who will offer commentary on Clark's book and uh, on his remarks. I will introduce uh, Bob first, and he will speak for about 15 minutes, and then I'll introduce John, and he will speak for uh, 15 minutes. Bob Destro is professor of law at the Catholic University of America and founding director of the Interdisciplinary Program in Law and Religion. He served as interim dean at CUA from 1999 to 2001. From 1983 to 1989, he was a member of the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. He served as special counsel to the Ohio Attorney General and the Ohio Secretary of State on election matters in 2004-2006, as general counsel to the Catholic League for Religious and Civil Rights from 77 to 82, and as an adjunct professor uh, at Marquette University from 78 to 82. Bob's from Ohio, and he received his bachelor's degree from Miami University in Ohio and then his law degree from the University of California at Berkeley. He has uh, expertise in many areas, including freedom of speech, freedom of religion, both national and international bioethics, and constitutional law. He is, um, has found, uh, written, well, I don't know about hundreds, but tens and tens of amicus briefs in many important life-related cases. He is, um, a former member of the board of Americans United for Life. I believe that, Bob, uh, you served as um, counsel to the state of Florida in the Terry Schiavo litigation. Uh, he, is, he, is a, he is an old friend, and that doesn't mean he's old or I'm old. It means we've known each other for a long time. <laughs> he's a dear friend of long standing. We're sorry that his wife, Brenda, couldn't come. We thought she was going to be able to join us. So now, Bob. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bill, for the introduction. And, you know, as they get longer, you realize that all those things you have been, you know. So, uh, so I, I suppose that one time uh, one of our kids said, well, what does that all mean to you? And they said, you're old. <laughs> so, so I guess we just kind of have to, uh, to take that as a given. Well, it's really great to be here, and it's really great to, to have read and, and now to be able to comment on, on Clark's work. I mean, Clark has always been, to me at least, the hist one of the historians of the pro-life movement. And I was very excited when I got a copy of the book and actually you know, was able to go back into it and, and think of those days that I spent in the, on the seventh floor of the stacks in the Berkeley Library, you know, trying to figure out if I could find somebody who could read Norman French so that we could really kind of uh, translate the case on which Cyril Means uh, actually uh, you know, rested most of his article. Now, 
What I'm not going to do today is, is to rehash that. I mean, one of the things I really want to encourage for you is please buy the book and read it. <laughs> you know, not only, will, uh, not only will you learn a lot, and, and I have to say, I mean, I thought I knew a lot about all this, but, but reading the book, I learned a ton. And, and, uh, and so, you know, I thought probably the best way to uh, approach things is to, to look at what I would consider to be the subtext of, of Clark's book. He doesn't address it directly, but it, it's like an undercurrent that runs through the whole book. And, uh, and uh, so I'm going to start by quoting the wisdom of the late philosopher George Santayana, who many of you have heard his comment that those who doubt or do not remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Now, in its original form, Santayana made several points that I think really are well worth considering in light of the exhaustive research that Clark has done uh, in this book and, and, and on the carnage, really, both human and cultural that the justices wrought on that cold January day in 1973 when they announced their decisions. You know, and I'm going to quote the three statements, basically, that lead, or the two statements that lead up to Santayana's famous comment. It says, first, progress, far from consisting in change, depends on retentiveness. Second, when change is absolute, there remains no being to improve, no direction is set for possible improvement, and when experience is not retained, as among savages, Infancy is perpetual. And then the last statement is the one that's famous. Those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. And so to the extent that the pro-life movement wishes to see progress, we really have to understand and to appropriate the lessons that Clark's and other people's research uh, tell us. And so first, you know, what are some of those lessons? First of all, it's not enough, I think not nearly enough, for us to criticize the court for its abuse of power. As uh, my friend Ken Martin leaned over and reminded me, he says, if you really want to go back to look at abuse of power, start with Marbury versus Madison. You know? and, and that is uh, you know, deciding, a, deciding an issue that was not before them. Uh, you know, though that criticism is richly deserved, we really do have to take a very hard look at the attitudes and narratives that have given us the dubious legacy of Roe versus Wade. We have to appropriate the literature, literature of the time, including the record that Clark so masterfully mines, to see the nature of the challenge that we face going forward. So let me begin with the narrative, because it starts, it tells us a lot about the attitudes, both social and political, that shape the narratives of those who so earnestly defend Roe versus Wade, Doe versus Bolton, and, and what can only be termed the progressive ideology of abortion rights today. That narrative is aptly summarized at the beginning of Char uh, Clark's chapter six. It, at the very beginning, he quotes a letter written by David Tunderman to Roy Lucas, both who had served as co-counsel to Sarah Weddington and Roe versus Wade. And Tunderman makes the following observation, which I think is, uh, is very relevant in light of what Dr. Yost told you a little earlier about going to Princeton, how she wanted to talk about Geraldine Ferraro, but not, uh, but not the abortion cases. And I quote, it says, where the important thing is to win a case, no matter how. However, I suppose I agree with Cyril Means's technique. Begin with a scholarly attempt at historical research. If it doesn't work, fudge it as necessary. Write a piece so long that others will read only your introduction and conclusion, and then keep citing it until courts begin to pick it up. This preserves the guise of impartial scholarship while advise, advancing the proper ideological goals. Now, I'll tell you, that sums it up in a nutshell. I mean, if you want to say, see Abuse of Discretion by Clark Forsyth. I mean, this is, uh, this is, this is exactly what went on. And, and as you, you know, and as I, uh, uh, as I was telling Clark just before we started, you know, when I 
was, you know, I started working on the first uh, article that I wrote. It was a kind of a short, you know, directed research paper for my uh, mentor and former, you know, now the late David Lewisell. And, uh, and, you know, I read Means's case. You know, I kept looking at it. And I said, you know, they said that the, 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 uh, the guy who had, had kicked the woman, you know, was released to Maine Perners. You know, I thought, what's a Maine Perner? So I pulled out my Black's Law Dictionary and I said, and I found out that a Maine Perner was, you know, a medieval bail bondsman. You know, and then it, the light went on. It's like, well, they didn't let him go. They set him out on bail. And the rest of the case means that they wanted him back. Now, you know, I thought, then I started thinking, well, how could somebody who's a reputable scholar, quote, quote, uh, actually not miss that point? And the answer is, very simply, uh, is that this was never scholarship. This was the guise of impartial scholarship designed to advance the proper ideological goals. Now, one of the, one of the, uh, the, the good books that, that uh, Clark cites in Abuse of Discretion is the historian David Garrow's equally fascinating book, uh, for much the same reasons, called Liberty and Sexuality, The Rights of Privacy and the Making of Roe versus Wade. It was printed in 1994. It, just, it shows just how ideological the drive was and remains to this day. The main point of Garrow's book was the judicial activism under the guise of the right to privacy is a powerful antidote for what he considered to be the failure of the body, body politic to adopt policies currently favored by progressives, however you define that term. He makes this point in every chapter by recounting in excruciating detail the background, the labors, the triumphs, the setbacks of the men and women who worked for nearly 50 years to make abortion a fundamental right. I want you to think about that. 50 years they worked on it. And if you look back at some of the other major Supreme Court decisions, like Brown versus the Board of Education, that was well over a 50-year endeavor, and we're still not done with that one. And so, so to, uh, to, jo to Garrow and Justices Goldberg and O'Connor, these activists are and were noble, enlightened, selfless folk, worthy of inclusion in Garrow's words, quote, for all time in America's constitutional pantheon. Okay? Now, neither Garrow nor any recent commentator on the pro-choice side of the political divide opened up by Roe has given any attention to the social, cultural, and legal implication of the subtext that I'm talking about in Clark's book. Both Abuse of Discretion and Garrow's earlier book is an examination of whose views count in the political and judicial process and those who do not. As uh, a, um, an advisor uh, to a cabinet member whose name you would recognize but who needs to remain uh, unnamed at this point, told me just a few weeks ago, you know, pro-lifers and those evangelical types, well, they have a very high ick factor. So I want you to think about that. that. This is the ick factor that decides cases. Neither the court nor any of the commentators since Roe directly explores these cultural as well as political effects of Roe. But Clark, Clark's book does that and convincingly, convincingly makes the case that to borrow another phrase from Garrow, quote, landmark decisions sometimes promise more than they deliver, unquote. So what we must not ignore as we look at the future is that the Obama administration and its pro-choice allies strongly believe that judges must take the law into their own hands whenever it is out of step with the moral sensibilities of what Justice O'Connor termed in Planned Parenthood versus Casey, quote, the thoughtful part of the nation, unquote. For they certainly see themselves and the justices as protagonists of our, um, and the protagonists of our nation's abortion policies as a part of that elite group. So they are the thoughtful part of the nation. We are the icky part of the nation. In, in the words of pro-life advocates, in words that pro-life advocates would be well advised to ponder carefully in the context of euthanasia, assisted suicide, and other important cultural uh, 
issues, including religious liberty uh, and gay marriage, gay, David Garrow's book recounts what Clark has now documented. Roe versus Wade was part and parcel of what the Southern governors used to call nullification. A new and very important turn was taken, according to Garrow, in 1931, when, and I quote now, one young supportive woman lawyer, Dorothy Kenyon, advanced the novel contention that rather than continuing to focus on legislative repeal of federal and state anti-contraception laws, it would be preferable to get away from the law by the simple expedient of forgetting about it. Terming this option nullification, she argued that it would be better to bypass legislative bodies and concentrate on public opinion in the hope that someday sentiment of the community might be strong enough to impress our enforcement officers into non-enforcement. Morris Ernst, the counsel to Margaret Sanger at the time, saw it as somewhat differently. And he said, and these are the words that I really think you need to pay attention to, quote, nullification will take place by the constant whittling away of the law by judicial decisions. Birth control statutes will not be repealed until they have already been nullified, or it's predicted, but the essence of change would be judicial incrementalism. Ernst was prescient. Doing constitutional interpretation has become like common law, and judging by the results, the strategy has been enormously successful. It was followed by the advocates of legal abortion, both before and after Roe. Gay rights advocates utilized, utilized an incrementalist approach on their way to seeking full parity for gay marriage. We have now seen the same process in the field of euthanasia, where the incrementalist approaches have begun to get some traction in several states. And uh, at least for now, the court has, for now, refused to hold that the right to assisted suicide is a constitutional right, but don't bet the farm on it. Uh, the only casualty has been the rule of law itself. But Justice Blackmun, who's, who was rarely constrained by it, would be proud. He had anticipated as early as 1971 that the logic of the abortion right, quote, would inevitably entail recognition of a right to commit suicide. And we see that in Europe today. We now know that the empty vessel he created in 1973 contains far more than meets the eye. So what should be done? Well, the first, and I'm going to be by, end by just giving you a couple of uh, examples. The first thing that must be done is we must do exactly what the advocates in Roe versus Wade did not. We have to burrow ourselves deeply into the science. If you look today, you will see the science in the science of embryology, in the science of uh, mammalian cloning, and in the uh, in the science in the emerging the amazing things that are emerging in neuroscience, we are now seeing that we can communicate with people who are in communicative, who are in persistent vegetative states. The state of the history, you know, thank heaven that the, that the court did not decide those cases back then. I can tell you that these cases are going to continue to be decided on records that are insufficient. I can tell you based on the Terry Schiavo case that we asked the courts you know, we asked the courts to say, let's get her into a functional MRI machine and let's see if she's really there or not. And they said no. They didn't want to know. You know, basically, they the, basically it was like she was dead, they had decided she was dead, and that was it. You know, but do we focus on the past or do we look to the future? And my suggestion to you is that we must look at these advances in embryology and do what Georgia did. You know, allow embryos to be adopted. You know, give them legal status. You know, so that, that the, the public itself, the people that we're fighting over with the pro-choice crowd will see that there's somebody else there. The same thing is true now in neuroscience. We see it in, uh, in the, as, 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 as what? People in nursing homes? No. We need to be on our side adopting brain injured soldiers who need the kind of, of, of treatment that only advances in neuroscience can give. You know, we need to find our allies where we find them because they're not in the culture. And if, if, uh, if Clark's book shows anything, it's that, you know, we can win in the long term, you know, but it's going to take a long time and we need to know what we're up against. And so that's why I recommend to you strongly, read the book, 
you know, get him to sign it while you're here, <laughs> and, uh, and enjoy it and learn from it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. Um, our second commentator is uh, John Eastman, who's the Henry Salvatore Professor of Law and Community Service at Chapman University School of Law. And he was dean uh, of that law school from June 2007 to January 2010. Prior to joining the law school faculty, he served as law clerk to Justice Clarence Thomas and uh, Judge Mike Ludig on the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals. He earned his JD from uh, University of Chicago, where he served on the Law Review, was a Bradley Fellow in Research and Constitutional History, and an Olin Fellow in Law and Economics. He also has a PhD and a Master's in Government from the Claremont Graduate School. A very well-educated man who is very involved in a lot of litigation having to do with life issues, distinguished uh, constitutional law professor. I want to mention one, one thing he did that ties him uh, to Bob Destro. He also worked at the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights uh, for some years. And the reason I mention that is because you could sum up the problem we face in America in a nutshell, which is how is it that the most, most fundamental right of all the right to life is not protected as a civil right in this country. So join me in welcoming uh, John Eastman. Thanks so much for being here. And Clark, what a, what a, a monumental uh, a project you've undertaken. It's, it's more than giving birth. Uh, four, or <laughs> four or five years is more than nine months. And uh, it took... Uh, <laughs> Now, 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 I got to quickly backtrack on that for all the ladies in the room. <laughs> I suspect uh, the pains were of a different sort. Um, uh, you know, the book is not as long as it appears because about half of it are footnotes. Um, and, and, and I think that's extremely important uh, uh, because what Clark has, doc Clark has documented here is um, the lack of a record in Roe versus Wade. Um, but what we're facing now is uh, a mentality where even the most comprehensive of records don't matter. Uh, uh, we are, we are uh, living through our version of Soviet-style science, where you draw the conclusion and then you backfill to create science to support it. False, patently false, uh, uh, transparently false though it may be. Um, and and, and that's, that's a huge problem. We're dealing with it now in the Arizona case. Now, I, I gotta uh, tell a story from my days at the Supreme Court, because the, the right to die cases were there. Um, the clerks uh, all on Thursday nights rotate uh, hosting a, a dinner for all the other clerks. And uh, the Thomas clerks, when it was our turn, decided to serve Domino's pizza at our dinner. Uh, we, we, you know, we, we did it kind of with a thumb in the eye, but it was a much bigger thumb in the eye of our colleagues than we had anticipated, because unbeknownst to us, that was Harry Blackman's birthday, the day we served Domino's pizza at the court. Um, uh, so that was, that was great fun. Um, uh, my task is to talk about how this book is uh, fitting into the current state of affairs. And uh, there's both ground for uh, optimism, but also some ground for pessimism. And I, and I want to talk on the pessimism first. This issue about the science, um, no matter how um, uh, comprehensive the science is, uh, that, that the courts are going to ignore it, um, or the other side is going to phony up their own science to try and um, uh, neuter it. Uh, and, and we see that happening in the current cases that are heading to the court. Uh, the 13 states that have adopted 20-week uh, uh, bans or re regulations of post-20-week abortions except for life and serious health risks to the mother based on pretty well-documented evidence of fetal pain and um, uh, astronomical increase in risk to the mother uh, beginning at 12 weeks and exponentially increasing every week thereafter. And so what has the other side done to negate this evidence? Well, they produce studies that say exactly the opposite. Right? And now, uh, I'm reminded of an old debate I had, I think it was at Princeton years ago, on, on uh, Ronald Reagan's uh, 
uh, uh, policies of supporting the Contras in Nicaragua, and somebody got up and said, well, those are your facts. Now let me tell you my facts. And, and you know, it seems to me that what we're infected with here is this, no, this, this there, there are no such thing as facts. This is pervasive in our society. It's not that somebody was saying something false and something true, and the purpose of the inquiry was to try to figure out which was which. It's that we all have our own worldview that we write around us, and that becomes fact for us. Justice Kennedy's worldview gets written around him, and that becomes fact for him. Uh, and that's a great danger, uh, not just to the rule of law, but the rule of anything. Uh, you cannot have rules if, that, if that's persuasive. And I suspect that that, that, that was, was what drove Justice Douglas and Brennan, more so than even Blackman, as, Car as, as Clark's book points out. Blackman was not the driving force behind this. They, they were. Uh, and, and, and so there were facts uh, that they knew, despite what they say in the opinion. Justice Brennan had argued it in Griswold. Um, uh, uh, you know, the concern was that if we find a right to contraception, it might lead to a right for abortion. And it was Brennan that said during the oral argument at Griswold, no, that would never happen, I suppose, because uh, abortion is the killing of a life and being, unlike contraception. So, so years later, uh, when Blackman writes um, in Roe that the judiciary at this point in the development of man's knowledge is not in a position to speculate about the answer to the difficult question of when life begins, it wasn't because the evidence wasn't well enough known by then. I mean, the evidence on that question had been known for centuries. <laughs> Brennan himself knew it a decade earlier. <laughs> the problem, the deeper problem, is it didn't matter to them uh, that life had begun. Uh, so that's, that's the, the, the pessimism side here. There are other things uh, one can learn in this book. Uh, many things. And, and the, the level of detail. Uh, and, 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 you know, all we can do faced with a society where those kind of things don't matter is continue to press them well-documented, well-argued, well-articulated, well-peer-reviewed the way this has done. And that's why I say begin with the back and look at the, the scope of the footnotes that is done here. And, the, and, the, and we've got to continue to make the case that becomes irrefutable because it is so well-grounded in science. We can't nuance over problems in the science. We've got to confront them. We have to be impeccably accurate in our claims in order to finally beat this, this genie back. Um, uh, so other, other things, uh, Justice Brennan's memo to Blackman early on, the right to abortion, except to the extent that the state would require abortions to be performed by a doctor, and allowing f that the states could impose certain time limits uh, at a certain time after conception. This was, this was Brennan in one of the early memos. Um, uh, Blackman's first proposal, as Clark pointed out, that all restrictions on abortion after the first trimester are probably going to be valid. Right? These, these, these are the things these guys knew, and it was just an exercise of raw will that they, that they, that they did something different. And so uh, let, th that's, that was then, and so now let's look at the differences now. Um, so what's happened with these 13 states that have adopted these bills, and, and, and it's uh, the, really the, the exponential increase in risk to maternal health that comes in late-term abortions, uh, uh, and this evidence of fetal pain. Uh, and uh, that is changing the narrative for all but the most doctrinaire of legislators and our fellow citizens, because the old saw that there's just a clump of um, a mere mass of tissue just doesn't work well when, when you can envision them feeling pain uh, while the abortion is uh, being conducted. That is having a dramatic change because it, it highlights what Blackman and Brennan knew, but they refused to acknowledge. It highlights what the ultrasound technology is increasingly telling our young people. It's why, it's why, young, it's why young kids in their 20s um, are more pro-life today than their parents and grandparents are because they are more in tune with the science. You know, you, you don't start naming it and put their brothers and sisters up on the refrigerator that they grow up with in an ultrasound picture without them realizing um, what, what we should have all known and what Blackman and Brennan and Clark points out knew, that this is a human being. And then you add to that gloss that they feel pain when they're tearing their arms from them or crushing their skull. Oh my God, how gruesome can it be? This, this is the narrative that is now being written. And it's already, I believe, 
chained Justice Kennedy's heart and soul on the question. I mean, think about it. His repudiation, uh, well, uh, his contention that the deal that he had struck with Justices Souter and O'Connor in Planned Parenthood versus Casey, that they then repudiate uh, shortly thereafter, led to one of the most strident dissenting opinions in all of Supreme Court history by a justice who's not known for strident opinions in any of his writings. Uh, and that was in the Nebraska partial birth abortion case. Um, a, a, a case, by the way, you want to talk about the manipulation and the raw will that went on here. Uh, a, a, a case that itself involved a manipulation of the evidentiary record by a young lawyer in the White House uh, counsel's office named Elena Kagan. And, and this part of the story, we tried to get it brought up during her confirmation hearings. But one of the critical issues in that case was, is there ever any medical necessity for stopping the birth midway through the birth canal uh, to perform the abortion? And the answer to that was clearly no. And there was a peer-reviewed medical article in the record that said that at Kagan's suggestion that review that that evidence was doctored before it was submitted to the court to take that line away because she knew how devastating it was to the argument that they were making again exercise of raw will justice kennedy i believe has now seen that um, and so you get lines in that gonzalez opinion where his dissent in the nebraska case becomes the majority opinion and uh, it is now uncontested that a fetus is a living organism while within the womb, whether or not is it viable outside the womb. The unborn child, and he sprinkled that phrase throughout the opinion. I think uh, Justice Ginsburg was apoplectic. Oh. The unborn child is entitled to respect for the dignity of its human life. Right? And so what we have here in Gonzales uh, is a change in the thinking on the critical vote on the court right now. Um, that the old lie viability line that was adopted in Roe without any evidence or argument or reasoning, but an exercise of raw will. What Justice O'Connor used to call a line that was on a collision course with itself uh, has now been demonstrated not to matter. That there are, that it is a one dimensional line that fails to take account of other significant state interests, the gruesomeness of partial birth abortion that was at issue in Gonzales. Pre-viability partial birth abortions were also banned by that statute and yet upheld by the court. So the viability line has already been breached. This human suffering, the pain to the fetus, and the increased uh, risk to the mother's health are other significant state interests that are not on that one-dimensional matrix given to us by the viability line. And I think, I think that entire line is now ripe uh, to be discarded as a result of these cases. I don't know whether it'll be the Arizona case uh, or one of the others. Uh, we do know that there's no circuit split <laughs> among the courts, uh, which is you know, kind of one of the triggering events for Supreme Court review. But we also now know that the other side has deliberately chosen not to bring these cases in circuits where they're likely to get a circuit split. So, um, uh, uh, so I think that demonstrates that they are nervous of, 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 about where this is going as well, as well they should be. The thought of taking a human being uh, uh, and doing what Justice Kennedy are, uh, described in gruesome detail uh, in those two cases uh, and not having anything to say about it by the people of this country is not something I think the court can long tolerate. Um, and I'm very optimistic that one day soon uh, we will get back on the path for securing the blessings of liberty, not just for ourselves, but for our posterity. Thanks. Hi, I'm Anna Franzanello, and I'm one of the attorneys at AUL. And it's my pleasure to introduce our final speaker today, Ovid Lamontagne, the general counsel of AUL. Prior to joining AUL in May, Ovid was a shareholder at um, one of New Hampshire's top law firms, Divine, Millimet, and Branch, where he served since 1986. And to get a visual for that, that's when I was in kindergarten. Um, <laughs> 
representing clients in complex business transaction and commercial litigation, specializing in areas of healthcare, not-for-profit charitable trust litigation, and construction law. Ovid also served as general counsel to several non-for-profit organizations and was involved in many civic, charitable, and political organizations. In addition to his distinguished legal career, Ovid is a recovering politician, running for the U.S. Senate seat in 2010 and winning the Republican nomination for governor of New Hampshire in both 1996 and 2012. Among his many awards, Ovid has been recognized and ranked uh, as a top-rated lawyer in healthcare by American Lawyer Media and Martindale Hubble. He has also been ranked by Chambers USA as one of America's leading attorneys in general commercial litigation and was selected by his peers for inclusion in the Best Lawyers in America 2012 in the field of commercial litigation and in the field of litigation construction. Ovid is also a recipient of the Americans for Prosperity 2011 Conservative of the Year Award, the Daniel Webster Council BSA Distinguished Citizen of the Year Award in 2009, and the Franco-American of the Year in 2002. Now, in light of Professor Destro's insights, uh, I'm going to skip some of the other things I was going to say so you don't have to feel like too much of a has-been. Um, <laughs> but I'll, <laughs> I'll end my introduction um, with what I know that Ovid would tell you is his, uh, his finest achievements, his marriage to his wonderful wife, Betty, and being a father to two adopted daughters uh, and a foster father to a special needs son, Ovid Lamontagne. Good afternoon, and I'm glad that Anna was paying attention in kindergarten to uh, <laughs> learn how to read. Um, my name is Ovid Lamontang, and I'm very pleased to be with you this afternoon. And on behalf of the Board of Directors, the Board of Advisors, management, and staff of Americans United for Life, I want to thank Professors Destro and Eastman for participating in this book launch of our colleague Clark Forsythe's wonderful book uh, on a very tough topic, abuse of discretion. I also want to thank you for joining us. It's very important to have people active, engaged, informed on this most important civil rights issue of our time. And your being here gives testimony to that and affirms and supports our work at Americans United for Life. In a most special way, I want to thank Karen Forsyth. You see, Karen Forsyth is the inspiration for Clark. Now, Clark just celebrated his 55th year yesterday, 55th birthday, that is. And you should know that Clark has been a nonprofit lawyer in the pro-life movement for 28 years, which means that half of his life has been dedicated to this work. But that could only be done with the love and support, friendship of his wife, Karen, to whom he's dedicated this book. So Karen Forsythe, thank you. Now, for those lawyers in the room, you'll, you will be impressed by the revelations of abuse of discretion, beginning with a profound revelation that most of us didn't appreciate when we were in law school. And that is that both Roe versus Wade and Doe versus Bolton were decided on motions to dismiss with absolutely no record, no evidentiary record. And yet, when you read those decisions, you'd think there was a full record developed, yet there was none. When you read this book, you learn about the inner workings of the court, disturbing inner workings. And when you read this book, you'll have an historical sense about how we have gone from 1973 to today. But on behalf of Americans United for Life, I want to share with you that this book is not an historical book. This book is a reflection of the strategy that we're employing to one day lead to a day when there is no more Roe versus Wade or Doe versus Bolton. And our organization has been inspired by the insights of Clark Forsyth. And the strategy uh, that we take is to remind the people, legislators, judges, citizens of these great states of ours in America, that there are two victims of abortion, the unborn child and the woman who's been exploited by the procedure. Health risks and harm to women is an untold story that Clark's book gives life to again. And the risks and harm to women is what inspires us to draft model legislation that focuses on the two victims of abortion and why we're launching 
a women's protection project this year, to educate Americans that the horrors of Kermit Gosnell's clinic are the result of Roe versus Wade and Doe versus Bolton. The horrors of Kermit Gosnell's clinic are not an aberration. This is what happens to women every day in America. We are going to continue to work to educate the people. Charmaine says the science has already educated the people that there is a life in being in a profound, intimate way. It's incredible what people learn about fetal development. What they don't know is the harm to women. So on the back and strength of the book, which is a reflection of Clark's scholarship for 28 years and his advocacy, effective advocacy, we're going to continue to work as an organization to earn your support, to earn your help, and together to work to make America a nation that respects life in fact and in law. So with that, I'd like to call our formal proceeding here to an end and let you know that Clark will be at the entrance of our hall here, uh, ready, willing, and able to sign your book, and um, his book, that is, for you, <laughs> and also ready, willing, and able to answer questions. And again, I'm very proud uh, to call the wonderful colleagues at Americans United for Life my friends, and I'm very proud to count among my colleagues and friends an outstanding lawyer by the name of Clark Forsyth. Congratulations, Clark.